This is Gail Morgan welcoming you to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Now, your host, James Just. Thank you for joining me today. With me is Richard Fields and John Cameron, as usual. Hey, Richard, when can you tell if a politician is lying? When his mouth is open. Uh, and, and I mean, that's an old joke, but it's actually true. And, and the thing I think, you know, the reason I the reason this is significant right now is because we need to remember that governments, all governments are controlled by politicians. So governments are controlled by liars. Uh, the master politician LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson, uh, claimed his great society would end poverty. Well, it didn't end poverty. It reduced it a little bit, mainly by transferring uh, uh, income from the middle class, not the, not the upper class, from the middle class uh, to the uh, lower class, uh, which, you know, to the extent that uh, people are not, you know, dying, uh, uh, you know, of starvation or something, I guess that's good. But they're also uh, not particularly happy. People have to be productive to be happy. Uh, people who are not productive tend to be a little bit bored, use drugs more. So now we have... Uh, we started back in the in the 70s, 60s, actually, when uh, the war on poverty started. We started seeing uh, a ramp up in the use of uh, dangerous and illicit drugs. Enter the drug war by uh, by uh, Richard Milhouse Nixon, which of course has not ended drug abuse. Drug abuse has been increasing dramatically ever since, and with more and more drugs being uh, abused. And of course. Uh, uh, drugs are happily supplied by diligent farmers in Mexico, Afghanistan, uh, Colombia, other places that you may re recognize from other news stories. Uh, and and in, the, in, in the meantime, are, are largely, at the time, not so much anymore, but at the time, free market economy, finally brought the Soviet Union to its knees, and uh, it inspired China to uh, do a, a rough copy of capitalism. So the Cold War ended. That left a problem for the military industrial complex. So they cast about for a new one when uh, Saddam Hussein in Iraq decided that he would, uh, uh, with the permission of, uh, of April Glaspie, uh, the uh, uh, ambassador to, uh, to Iraq at the time, with her express permission, he decided to annex Kuwait. Uh, George W. Bush didn't think that was a good idea, so they started a, a war on Iraq, a war on Islamic fundamental, fundamentalism, a war on terror. We all know how that's ended up. We uh, invaded Iraq. We invaded Afghanistan. We've largely uh, or effectively lost the war in Iraq, and we suffered. Nobody can question whether we suffered a, a humiliating defeat in Af Afghanistan. The Taliban, who were the sworn enemy uh, of the United States and the uh, hotbed of uh, of uh, terrorists are now in charge. It took, took them, you know, a week to get in charge after we left. The war on poverty caused new problems. The war on drugs is an ongoing terror or failure. The war on terror is a continuing debacle that's driving us into bankruptcy. And now we believe that politicians, the liars, and their hand-picked hand -picked medical experts, when they claim they can win a war on a virus by shutting down the small business sector, the most vibrant part of our economy. When will we stop believing the liars? I, I, I've stopped. I've stopped believing the liars. But it's actually what what it's actually worse uh, in some ways because there there's no rational way you could look at um, the drug war and not come to the conclusion that its express uh, purpose was to enrich drug dealers and subjugate um, people of color. Uh, and you can't, you couldn't, because that's the outcome and it's been the outcome from the beginning and until now, uh, and, and then corrupt police forces and judges and border guards and all the rest of that. So um, you, that could be their only goal because that's what's happened over and over and over again and failure to recognize that and, and, and insisting upon doing more of the same really just entrenches the idea that these people must want to uh, destroy families of people with color, build prisons with people of color, uh, get uh, uh, turn those into uh, single head of household families and, and ruin the lives of, of people while enriching criminals. 
And there's no way with that amount of money that that money can't corrupt the, the very people who are supposed to protect us. So um, I think, um, you know, they should just come out and admit it that, you know, our goal all along. You know, is you know actually they have. Yeah. I mean, what you're saying sounds like a conspiracy theory. Yeah. But in an interview after the fact, John Ehrlichman, Nixon's chief of staff, expressly stated that the war on drugs was a war against blacks and against hippies, his perceived enemies in his 1968 or 1972 re-election bid. Uh, so, you know, there there is stated evidence from people close to the source that going after, uh, you know, marginalizing people of color and marginalizing uh, hippies or, or, you know, anti-war protesters more broadly was a specific goal of the drug war when it was initiated. It had very little to do with drugs, a lot to do with uh, uh, Nixon's uh, chances of being reelected in 1972, which unfortunately worked. Hmm. Yeah, well, and politicians yeah. saying one thing and the results being completely different are not uncommon. You know, the politicians who advocate for these lockdown policies, you know, they're the, actually the ones who say tax the rich, the wealthy must must pay. But the leading indicators of inflation, the world's 25 richest families are now 221 percent well richer than they were a year ago. Yeah, that's two, that's 22 percent richer. Uh, 22. Uh, yeah, 22 percent. Twenty-two. You know, it feels like they might be 221 percent, but it's only 22 percent richer. But the rest of us are poorer, or certainly not any any uh, any better off than we were a year ago. All of the money created, not all, but um, the majority of the money created out of thin air by the Federal Reserve went into assets. Who owns the assets? The one percent. Yes, yeah, so they've gained over what three hundred and twelve billion. It says here. It's, I'm not sure if that's a typo or if that's my eyesight. No, the, the three hundred twelve should be right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, the two. It says two hundred twenty-one, but I can't tell if that's my eyesight or if no, it's, it's, it was my typo. <laughs> ah, so we can blame Richard for me being wrong on statistics. Yay! <laughs> I'd, I'd actually like to look at, and I didn't do my homework, and shame on me. Um, I'd like to look at growth in, in upper middle class uh, assets, because um, the you know, at least in California, not in the rest of the country, um, housing prices. Well, I know in in the coastal western states, and I think also in the Northeast, uh, the the primary source of wealth for most upper middle class people is, well, the first is their house and second is their pension. And uh, housing prices have gone up exponentially because of the uh, NIMBY stuff and, and uh, foreign money coming in and uh, lots of people buying uh, houses to use them as rentals. And uh, people's uh, 401ks or 403bs or whatever they are uh, have risen because, as Richard rightly pointed out, uh, a lot of that printed money ends up in the stock market. Uh, there are only so many stocks there, and if, if you're chasing them, their price is going to go up. Not today, though. Not today. Uh, prices. We're, we're recording this on, on uh, what will probably be the Black Monday of September 1920, or 2021. Yeah, 2021. Well, you know, that, that yeah. And uh, I think we're going to talk about inflation a bit. Yeah, it's right next. It's the Consumer yeah. Price Index. And oddly enough, the uh, Producer, Producer price. price Index are both up 8.3%. And one of those is kind of an unprecedented number. That well, yeah, I mean, the, the, the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, is so politically gamed that it doesn't really mean a whole lot. They use uh, uh, adjustments. They say that if steak goes up, you'll, ch you'll switch to hamburger. Uh, and so they substitute one thing for another in order to keep the... Uh, the number uh, under control, at least for the popular press. So the CPI, and it's also what's used to uh, increase uh, Social Security benefits so they don't want it going up too fast, otherwise it would get expensive for the government. But the producer price index, which I, if I'm not mistaken, is not uh, compiled by government, is an accurate reflection of prices that manufacturers pay for their for the goods they need to, to make other things. It's the the cost of things, of commodities and other uh, inputs into the manufacturing process. And that's going up dramatically, nine, or eight, nine percent, something like that. And the, the simple fact of the matter is that if uh, the producer, if, if manufacturing costs are going up, it's only a matter of time before consumer costs will go up in order to reflect the uh, increased cost of business for uh, producers. Mm. So. Yeah, and there's one other uh, interesting tidbit about the, the Federal Reserve Board. 
uh, recently, a couple of board members uh, got slapped on the wrist for uh, profiting ahead of time through uh, stock trades uh, or some securities market trades that uh, that uh, that anticipated Federal Reserve action. And of course, Fed Reserve uh, Federal Reserve Board Chairman uh, uh, Powell decided to uh, uh, change the rules, make it make the Fed more transparent. But lo and behold, guess who also had a huge investment? in municipal bonds just prior to the Fed deciding to actually buy municipal bonds. Jerome Powell. I imagine that. I'm, I'm shocked by that. I'm shocked by that. Jerome has, has such a tax burden that uh, that that he's uh, buying tax-free munis. I, yep. uh, yeah. I'm shocked by that, yeah. Well, well they, these, it'll, these all guys... be fixed. it'll all be fixed when they triple the alternative minimum tax. I, I have a, a little side our story on on the cost of doing business. Uh, NPR did a, a fluff piece about uh, micro businesses, uh, you know, single solopreneurships in the Portland area, and and had some fantastic success stories. And uh, you know, these are people who were who were uh, you know cooking pizza in somebody else's. Uh, commercial kitchen so they don't have to open a storefront, they're food truck people, and they they actually left in the story talking to uh, someone, I think it was a toy shop, but I could be wrong because I don't think any of those exist anymore. And the woman was talking about um, um, what she was doing to prepare for the holidays, and she said, well, we're uh, where we can, we're, we're buying way ahead of time. We're buying everything we can way ahead of time. Uh, because uh, prices are increasing at such a great rate, such a great uh, speed, prices are going up so fast that that if we buy now, we can avoid some of that if we can get it. And I'm actually shocked that they they left that in. Uh, and it used to be. I remember when Richard and I went to went to school. Uh, they, a century they ago. About, they taught what's that? A century ago. Century, well, not not quite, Richard. You're not quite that old. Uh, neither am I. Uh, they used to talk about inventory carrying costs because the cost of money was so much higher. Uh, well, the real cost of money is higher now because of, of inflation. But um, you know, people would would uh, calculate how much inventory they had on hand because they didn't want to tie up money in inventory due to uh, the cost of the money that was tied up in inventory. And then once um, you know, the cost of money dropped, at least in nominal terms, uh, people went to because of increases in technology uh, as needed purchasing. Uh, they would order something the day before they needed it in their factory because um, they they were trying to, uh, first, that, that first became popular because people were trying to avoid inventory carrying costs. And then with the increase in logistics and computer programs and warehousing technology and all the rest of that, um, you know, people no longer had to store stuff. So the inventory carrying costs, I don't even know if it's taught in business school anymore. But now, because prices are, are increasing so quickly, businesses are going back to the old way of doing business. They're, they're buying and storing stuff because they're absolutely sure that a month from now or two months from now or certainly six months from now, it's going to cost a whole lot more to, to buy it than it costs them to, to in the cost of money. So uh, we're seeing we're seeing real inflation everywhere. I don't know if either one of you guys do the shopping for your household, but every time I go to the store, even even you know when I go to Costco, I notice uh, that uh, that things some things that I that I'm buying now, and these are food products, are are almost double what they were three years ago, and um, you know it's just going to get worse. Is it? Yeah, no, with the having to go shopping these days is a it's almost a traumatic experience. You know, what used to cost thirty bucks for a shopping trip is now fifty, sixty dollars, and you're getting the same thing. You're going, How is this fifty bucks? And you've got like six things. You can carry it in your hand and now you're spending fifty dollars and you're going, This is ridiculous. But it is what it is. You know, it's the it's the times we live in and the gov and the results of government policy. But speaking of government policy, and we were talking about uh, individual workers they are now going to the IRS is now going to track every transaction above $600 that goes in and out of your bank account. 
Well, it's pending legislation. It hasn't passed yet. Hmm. But uh, you can be sure that that is not designed to go after the millionaire, after Bernie Sanders, millionaires and billionaires. That's going after you and I, anybody uh, in the middle class or even the lower middle class that they think might have uh, a nickel or two of extra income that is not, uh, that's escaping the, the, uh, the IRS uh, dragnet. It's the assault on gig workers. It's, it's a continued assault on independent workers. And it's, you, they want you to be an employee because you're easier to tax as an employee. It's, 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 I think it's that simple. I think they just want the money. And so they're going to sit there and track gig workers. And it's, it's just a continued assault. This crew in, in power hates gig workers. They just do. For whatever reason, whether it's because gig workers aren't unionized and don't want to be, or it's because you know they're more difficult to tax, this uh, you know the party in power does not like uh, gig workers. The Pro Act is they're trying to sneak. Essentially, they're trying to sneak the Pro Act into this budget bill that you no know, infrastructure bill. It's not even a budget bill. It's an infrastructure bill <laughs> that we talked about last week. Was literally everything except yeah, for it's, 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 it's a uh, Democratic wish list. The only ray of hope uh, that remains is that it is hanging by such a thread uh, with the, the Senate uh, equally divided and some recalcitrant Democrats in the in the House who actually want to get reelected next uh, year uh, that, you know, there's a possibility it won't pass. We can only hope. Well, and then then this six hundred dollar thing, the part of the uh, Obamacare, um, which, by the way, it wasn't a tax. Um, had some some reporting dodges hidden in it to where I think it was anything was it about it wasn't nine hundred dollars thousand dollar reporting something like that you had to ten ninety nine it and it created such a nightmare for um, for uh, businesses because if you purchase something above or somebody sold you something above not just income but any transaction like you're talking about transaction you had to create a ten ninety nine for it and track it and report it. And it was such a, a horrible mess that uh, it was almost uh, unanimously reversed by the uh, politicians less than a year later. So, you know, saying that you want to do this and, and having it fly, even putting the law in the books, because, you know, it'll take businesses and the government, uh, you know, probably six months to figure out how to implement the thing. So uh, not as not as easily said as done. But you're you're right, James. The the, the reasons are uh, independent business owners typically don't vote for big government. Uh, they're they're they wouldn't call themselves libertarians, but but many times they are. They certainly don't join unions, and self-employed people pay less tax, and they don't really pay less tax. They, they in essence pay more tax because they're paying both sides of Social Security instead of the employer paying half of it and passing that cost on to to consumers and also lowering wages. But uh, it's, uh, you know, that uh, those are just the wrong people. Those self-employed people are not going to vote for socialism. If they if they were socialists, they'd be going down some government job or education job or consulting for government or education, or they'd be going to a union working for the government or education. They they wouldn't be out there scratching and pulling and, and working side They just wouldn't do it. Yeah. Then, and one of the reasons I caught yesterday why this uh, transportation bill, and I just laugh that it's called it a transportation bill, <laughs> is that the it's hanging over the um, immigration issue. There's an immigration issue that's holding this up. And as we're watching down on the, the Haitian immigrants down at Del Rio, Texas, hanging out underneath that bridge, and there's a big movement now to try and fly some of them out. It's isn't it just the same? You know, Biden is not that much different than Trump, other than tone. Trump is less mean. I mean, Trump was more mean than Biden was on Twitter. I mean, essentially, it's the only difference in policy that I can tell. Well, no, yeah, I, mean, I mean, I mean, it's same boss, same as the old or new boss, same as the old boss. Very, very, very clearly, very little policy difference between the two. Uh, Biden has left uh, Trump's. Uh, horrendously uh, destructive tariffs in place. He's still uh, uh, you know, shipping people out of the country at the same rate uh, that, uh, that that Trump did. And there's no improvement on any of the uh, issues that actually count. I'm shocked by that new boss. Still printing money like like Trump it's was. Actually, actually, the the problems at the border are worse under Biden than they were under Trump. And um, I'm, you know. The, 
it just, despite all of our, our complaints about what's going on in this country, because they're all patently violate the Constitution, we know how much better the country could be if people were left to their own devices. Um, imagine how hard life must be in Haiti if you're willing to first make your way to Mexico and then go through Mexico to cross a border and hang out under a bridge in Del Rio, Texas. Is that where and, that, and we're talking about wading across the Rio Grande as well. Wading across the Rio Grande. Well, there there are some benefits to a drought. You know, you don't you typically you won't drown. But um, and we know I, one of my one of my dog walking friends that I that I see constantly is from Haiti, and uh, I, I talked to him uh, about conditions there. And this was before the earthquake, and he said they're a mess. They're a mess. They've always been a mess. They'll, they'll be a mess. So there are places that are a whole lot worse. And, and I think people still believe in the promise and the history of the promise of a better life in the U.S., even though, uh, you know, California government and federal government are doing their best to, to stomp out anybody's ability to start and run a business. So, by the way, once again, California is the absolute best state in the union for making it nearly impossible to start your own business. Yeah, and that's nothing new. Starting a business in California has been tremendously difficult for a long time, even if it's just trying to decipher what regulations you're supposed to follow and not. I mean, just trying to decipher that is, is complicated enough. Forget everything else about the expense and which permits you're supposed to get and how much the permits cost. Just figuring out which regulations you're supposed to follow is, is, a, is a nightmare here in California. And I, I love that word you used two or three times in a sentence, maybe two, permit. So where in the Constitution of the United States does it say that I need uh, a, a local government's permission to do something related to commerce? How, how dare they say that they have the power to permit me to do something of my own free will, which is not only going to benefit me, but the people that are providing goods and services to Yeah. In other words, the default position is starvation because you can't earn a living or permission uh, from the government to not starve uh, or go hungry or uh, live under the bridge or whatever. Which is an odd thing. If I remember correctly, the Constitution says that, that, those, uh, that those powers not enumerated to federal government are you know, basically held by the state. But the, 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 or the people. Or the people. And the assumption was always until maybe in the 1920s and it's just the, it's it's grown the inertia and magnitude of it has grown is that that people uh you know unless they they harmed somebody else or you know destroyed huge swaths of the earth or or, or poison their their next door neighbor's water or used a gun people were were free to uh, start and run a business to take an idea conceive of it, plan it out, take risks, acquire capital, and and grow money, to create money, the Adam Smith idea of the creation of wealth. And now it's it's people sit and wait for permission to do something that, that they no need no permission for. Well, according to the California Constitution, you have a constitutional right to earn a living. It doesn't say you have to get permission from the government to do it. But yet, here in California, you have to get permission from the government to walk down the street, essentially, nowadays. And so it's, we've become the exact opposite of what we used to be. But speaking of the future, and something that might strike a, a chord for uh, us libertarians, Bitcoin is now the official currency of El Salvador. They've That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've watched Bitcoin uh, move from a... Uh, asset that was owned only by uh, uh, conspiracy theorists and, and uh, borderline people that uh, were, you know, uh, tech nerds, that sort of thing, to a, a position now where it's, it's the reserve currency, or one along with the dollar, is the reserve currency of El Salvador, as well as uh, being uh, made or included in uh, exchange traded funds that are closed end funds that allow you to own Bitcoin as well as Ethereum. Uh, it's now being uh, part of the investments of uh, major uh, S&P 500 companies like uh, uh, like uh, like famously Tesla or MicroStrategy. Uh, and it's uh, 
uh, being uh, used as a, uh, a, a hedge by major insurance companies, Massachusetts Mutual. We're looking at the gradual and sometimes not so gradual acceptance of the cryptosphere uh, as an alternative to the dollar. And it, just in time, I mean, it used to be gold and it still is gold to a certain extent, but just in time because the, the dollar is losing uh, the confidence of governments around the world that used to have used to invest their uh, uh, excess reserves in, in dollars. They don't do it anymore. The uh, amount of dollars that are held by uh, foreign central banks like China has remained static or gone down over the last uh, couple of, uh, of years. Uh, it's uh, the dollar is uh, uh, used to be most transactions in world trade were denominated in dollars. It's that percentage of, uh, of uh, it has gone down, has a lot to do with sanctions, has a lot to do with uh, uh, government U.S. government regulation. It has a lot to do with simply the depreciating, depreciating value of the dollar. And that's against other world currencies, which are also uh, being depreciated by their, their, their central banks. So, you know, it's, you know, it's said that uh, the government can stop uh, cryptos anytime they want to simply by making them illegal. I'm not so sure because they're a little bit uh, slippery, slipper, slipperier than that. Slippery. At, least, uh, at least we hope so. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's uh, you know, that the, whenever the government wants control, they, they, uh, they pull a boogeyman out. You know, like when the, the drug war thing, the, the the idea that cryptocurrency, uh, the, the government tried to pitch the idea that, that uh, the only thing that was happening with cryptocurrency was used for drug deals and to, uh, to uh, supply arms to terrorists and all the rest of that. And, you know, basically uh, that was laughed at. Uh, you know, everybody, nobody bought into that. Even, even the politicians who were lying when they said it didn't believe it. And it was obvious they didn't believe it. So I think... Uh, crypto is here to stay. I, I um, somebody bet me uh, dinner that uh, that uh, Bitcoin would be at a hundred thousand dollars by the end of the year. Uh, the only reason I I care one way or another is because I like a free meal. But um, you know I think uh, people understand that uh, central governments are in their mindset they don't understand economics. They think that they can write a law to change something. Uh, if they want to change something, why don't they just pass a law to decrease the force of gravity? You know, as I'm getting older, getting out of bed's a lot harder. If they really have this power to do anything by waving their hands, just make gravity at 97% or 92%. But I don't think that's going to happen because they can't really have, do anything other than ruin what good people do uh, by, by their thought processes and, and uh, discipline. Well, well, John, as much as I'd like to end Gravity for you, I have to end the show from here at Libertarian Counterpoint. You can catch us next week. And please remember to love everybody. Thank you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint Show. In Sacramento, Channel 17 on Comcast, each Thursday at 8 p.m. and each Monday at 5.30 p.m. for the Knuckleheads of Liberty.